Hey, good morning. Scott Luton and Greg White with you here on Supply Chain Now. Welcome to today's show. Greg, good morning. How you doing? I am doing great, Scott. How are you? Fantastic. Uh, the hits will continue on today's yeah. show. We're talking about one of the hottest topics, two of the hottest topics, really, both from an industry standpoint and a consumer standpoint, right? The food supply chain and food safety. Yep. Uh, and Greg, we've got two industry experts that I think are really going to help us improve our supply chain IQ, right? No doubt. I can't wait. I, I'm afraid. I'm afraid to spoil it. So I'm going to let you proceed because okay. I want to shout out their names. But let's roll. Uh, let's do it. So real quick before we do. So to our, our listeners, if you enjoy this video interview, be sure to check out our podcast. We publish Monday through Friday, sometimes on Saturday, and you can find us and subscribe wherever you get your podcast from. Okay, with no further ado, I want to welcome in our guest today, Mike Watson, Chief Operating Officer with Tosca, and his colleague, Aubrey Duncan, uh, Director of Food Safety with Tosca. Hey, Mike and Aubrey, good morning. Yeah, good morning, Scott. Great. Great to good morning. Mike, Aubrey, good to see you. Good to great, see you. Great to have you on the show. Uh, Mike, you, this is, I think, your third or fourth appearance. We love our repeat guests, right? I, I love uh, being a repeat guest as well. Thanks for having me back. <laughs> and Aubrey, your first appearance with Supply Chain Now, and I, I love your background, which we'll learn more about in a minute. And, you know, we have not, uh, Greg and I were talking pre-show, uh, Mike and Aubrey, we haven't had enough experts on the show talking food supply chain and food safety. So I think we've got a, we've got a great lineup here. Yeah. Yeah. So, it's a, it's an interesting topic, uh, on a, on a normal day. I think it's an interesting topic. And right now with everything going on, I think it's particularly uh, sensitive. Yeah. Agreed. Agreed. Uh, but it's on, you know, it's, it's, uh, just like the term supply chain is on the tips of more tongues than ever before, I would think that even for even consumers that aren't involved in supply chain uh, are thinking a lot more than they typically do about food supply chain, food safety, and and what lies ahead. So appreciate y'all coming on and sharing your expertise and some of your insights. So, uh, Greg, before we get started, let's get to know Mike and Aubrey a little bit better. So, Mike, let's start with you and and folks that have, that have seen you uh, your earlier appearances will. Uh, know you a little better than some that are new, of course, but, you know, give us a refresher. Tell us about Mike Watson a little bit. Yeah, so uh, I'm the uh, COO with Tosca. I've uh, been, uh, been with Tosca about six years now, and, and prior to that, um, some just fantastic organizations that I've worked with, uh, including the Coca-Cola Company, uh, DHL, Roadway Express, um, great, great training organizations, great learning opportunities for me. Uh, also, currently, the uh, the chairman of the Reusable Packaging Association, which is a tremendous uh, uh, trade association uh, furthering the cause of reusable packaging uh, and eliminating one-way packaging, and then the chair-elect uh, for the Association for Supply Chain Management, uh, and uh, been been in the industry uh, much, much longer than I'd care to admit. <laughs> we always say more than two decades, Mike, and our, our agreement with all of our guests, <laughs> never say more than that. That's right. Yeah, it's uh, it's com coming up on, on two decades, give or take. There well, you go. I, you know, really given all of what Tosk is doing and, and all the growth there, uh, and then to, to be involved at, at senior leadership with two rock and roll organizations, such as Reusable Packaging Association and, of course, ASCM. I really don't believe you get any sleep at all, Mike, or you've got two or three clones. I don't know. One or the other. Well, I've got a very supporting family, a beautiful wife and daughter, uh, and a uh, just a phenomenal team at, uh, at Tosca that, that helps keep things uh, moving along nicely. Outstanding. Okay. Uh, hey, real quick before we get to Aubrey, because um, both of those organizations are great resources. Of course, ASCM.org is a great uh, resource for our listeners to check out a variety of supply chain thought leadership. What about uh, how can folks learn more about RPA? Yeah, uh, it is a uh, uh, reusables, uh, right? So, it, and actually, if you just go type in reusable packaging association, uh, it'll take you right to the link. Perfect. Okay. Aubrey, same question to you. So welcome to supply chain. Now Can't, looking forward to your, uh, your perspective today. Tell us about yourself. Thanks. So I'm Aubrey Duncan. I am the director of food safety at Tosca. Uh, I've been with Tosca for three years. Prior to that, I have about uh, six years of industry experience in the food industry. Um, I'm also on the RPA Food and Beverage Committee as the lead chairperson. And uh, I'm really excited to talk about food safety. Uh, it's one of the biggest concerns 
people might have when they're buying food at the grocery store, especially during a pandemic. Um, and from experience, I can say that most of us never anticipated that something this large would impact our business and day-to-day -day lives. Mm -hmm. uh, just a little bit of passion there, Greg, huh? Yeah, and expertise, too. I mean, it's really impressive this relatively early in your career, though I'm sure it doesn't seem like it to you, uh, to have done some of the things that you did. I got to surface this. So tell us why you're so driven and why it's this progression has been maybe easier for you than it might for some. Yeah, What's so I think, uh, I think the biggest reason I'm so driven is I was a student athlete in college. Uh, I was a swimmer at Virginia Tech and I've been competitive swimming since I was 12 years old. Uh, so it's kind of natural to me to wanna be the best in whatever I do. And I've always loved food. So I thought, you know, that's great job stability. Um, like to do good, make sure people are safe while they're eating their meals. Love that. Wow. And you working out at five o'clock in the morning. All <laughs> right. Yep. Four, and then at five o'clock in the evening. <laughs> yep. Yeah. So she, she was meant for supply chain since 12 years old. <laughs> yeah, <that's right>. <laughs> all never right. Sleeps just like in supply chain. <laughs> all right. So Mike, before we you know dive into uh, food supply chain, food safety, some lessons <clears> learned and, and the path forward. Uh, let's make sure we understand in a nutshell what Tosca does. So Mike, tell us more about Tosca. Yeah, so uh, Tosca, uh, reusable packaging company, right? Uh, we, we are the, uh, the provider of uh, RPCs or, or reusable plastic containers. We've been in business, uh, gosh, coming up on 61 years in, in June that we've been around. Um, and and our, our job is to provide innovative packaging solutions uh, that, that help optimize uh, supply chains through through um, uh, retailers and and suppliers and providers, primarily for perishable food. Mm. Um, we we partner with some of the largest uh, retailers, the largest suppliers, uh, the largest processors, uh, largest farmers uh, all across the world, uh, and we are a global organization as well. Uh, so we've got uh, got a presence in uh, Europe and the Middle East and and uh, all of North America. Uh, and, and really, at the end of the day, our, our goal is to eliminate waste throughout the entire supply chain, uh, again, primarily in the perishable food space. Gotcha. Okay. Mike, I think the interesting thing about what you do is you can see what you do every day <laughs> you go to the grocery store, especially when you pass. What I think of from the last time you were on the show is eggs, right? Yep. And the brilliance of the engineering of that, that carton, container, whatever you want to call it, that allows you to position the eggs to ship and store and position the eggs in the store without ever taking them out and risking breakage. So, yeah. I mean, there, there are a lot of benefits aside from the sustainability of reusability in, in terms of protecting the food as you, you know, as you deliver and store it as well, right? Yeah, and, and not not to be a plug for Tosca so much, but but when we talk about eliminating waste through the supply chain, the big waste component is food waste. Um, but by by shipping in our containers, we we don't damage food through transit. Uh, mm -hmm. Eggs, of course, being the most uh, the most breakable. But but meat, for example, when meat uh, travels, it can get bruised easily. And when right. meat gets bruised, it gets marked down. People don't buy it. Right. Um, but but we're we're not just in those visible supply chains like eggs. Uh, we ship produce. Uh, we we ship meat. We ship poultry. Uh, we ship seafood, uh, eggs, uh, cheese. Um, I, I think that's probably the the biggies, right? Um, no bacon. Is there any way we could get you? Uh, you know, bacon? <laughs> so bacon. Um, but but then globally too, we're we're in bread, uh, beverages, um, and and actually globally in a lot of non perishables as well, mm -hmm. uh, garments and pharmaceuticals and uh, cosmetics and and things like that. Just, just anything where we can take waste out of the supply chain. Uh, and again, w waste, not just food waste, but right. labor waste as well. Right. Uh, you know, Andy, miles are, waste. Yeah. Taking miles out of the, out of the transit, uh, adding more cube utilization on a, on a truck, um, you know, labor in, uh, in, in Greg, the example you gave of the eggs where it's a retail ready package that they put it in the cooler, drop the wall and it's ready to go meaning you don't have utility knives in the hands of the store workers cutting open boxes and stacking. 
which is right. not a, a terribly value added service. And, and I, I think we'll probably get into this a little bit today, right? Yes. With, with right. labor challenges uh, and, and trying to minimize contact, if you can set a product in a cooler and, and walk away and go to another value added service, boy, there, there's a, a tremendous amount of value in that and a tremendous, tremendous amount of waste if you're, if you're not doing that, right? Yeah. yeah. Well, and, and to your point, we're going to dive right into that. And Greg's going to, going to lead us off here, but before he does, uh, Mike, you didn't tell me you were bringing one of your supply chain planners who evidently is waiting very patiently to be interviewed right behind you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's the, uh, the, the funny story behind him. Uh, so I, many, many, many years ago, I bought a, a matching set of the, a cigar store Indian and the, and the cowboy. And, and I ended up with, the cowboy and the, the Indian is still in uh, in my mom's uh, basement up in Ohio. Wow. Uh, yeah, love. You, you know, get a good the... picture of who Mike Wasson is by looking at the background. <laughs> right. right. Well, <laughs> if you, he if you look off on the other himself. side, you really, there's quite a, quite an assortment of, uh, of stuff over there. I love it. Well, Greg, take us away yeah. as we dive into uh, food supply chain. Well, so, uh, you know, to segue just a little bit, I think it's interesting that we're talking about food waste because one of the big topics during this COVID, um, this COVID pandemic is the issue of food not getting to the market and not getting to the consumer and going to waste on the ground or, you know, at the dairy or, or wherever else. So anything we can do in that regard is valuable. But at the same time, we're talking a lot about food shortages and we hear this all the time, the supply chain is broken or the supply chain is breaking or whatever it is. So let me just ask you, and I think, I think I'm going to flip the script a little bit, Mike. I'd like to ask Andrea this. What do you Aubrey. think? Or Aubrey. Aubrey. I'm sorry, Aubrey. I'm sorry. <laughs> Aubrey. Sorry. No problem. <laughs> another swimmer, I know. Um, Aubrey, Aubrey, this. Um, are we going to run out of food? So the short answer is no, uh, but the food supply chain is pretty complex. Uh, so a lot of people have seen in the news that milk's being dumped, fields are being plowed. Uh, right. We're talking about livestock depopulation, um, but there's some things to consider. So we are processing at slower efficiencies because we've put social distancing in place. Some of our processors have shut down um, and those materials cannot be converted to raw, to raw goods. Uh, and because that's happening, we see a shortage with an uptick in demand. So people are panic buying and we can't meet those needs. Mm. Our grocery supply chain is meant to be just in time so they can preserve freshness and quality of the product that we're buying, especially in perishables. Right. Um, and they want to limit waste. So if they stock up on six months worth of salad, it's probably going to go bad. They're going to lose money and they're going to have food waste. Um, we also know that our supply chain uh, some products are stored for months before they actually make it to the grocery store. Uh, so we're talking about grain, some types of meat are frozen before they're sold, uh, and then peak demand. So back in March, when this really started happening, people started working from home, we were 100% year over year last year sales in retail grocery. Um, and right about now, we're between 20 and 30%. So it's slowed down a bit, and the store should be able to pick back up to meet the regular demand, even with efficiency slowing and uh, with plant closures. Mm. Aubrey, aren't you glad you're not responsible for toilet paper and paper towels in a grocery store? I am right? definitely, definitely glad. <laughs> Who would have ever thought that? And you know, that really started the conversation around the supply chain is breaking or broken and then food mm. concerns as well. And I think we've seen so many adaptations of the supply chain, not consumers getting involved and distributors distributing direct to consumers as well. Right. So well, real quick on that, Greg, I think what's fascinating about that is, uh, you know, the, the toilet paper manufacturers, they have ramped up production, right. And uh, in, in, in times where, you know, unprecedented demand, right. And then you look at, uh, disinfectant wipes and you see what companies like Clorox are doing. Some of these other folks, they know, they found out that the demand is not going to be just a, uh, a blip. They're projecting demand, a heightened demand for several years. So what are they doing? They're investing in new production lines to meet that demand for years to come while stepping up production in the meantime. So it's really, you know, it's amazing to see how supply chain folks, when they, when they, they wrap their head around the data, 
whether it's going to be a small little blip or, or some kind of extensive uh, extended demand and figure out the game plan. You know, that, that, that's what I love about this industry. Well, that's what Aubrey was just talking about too, is, I mean, there, you know, the initially produce demand went down dramatically as people quarantined in place. Cause I think they all plan to eat frozen pizzas or something <laughs> like that the whole time. <laughs> But, but definitely seeking comfort. <laughs> yeah, that's right. And I think ultimately people found they found their their cooking persona more and they started buying more of the fresh goods that you all protect, right? And and then as you said, panic buying hits anytime you hear anything about a shortage, of course. Even if you wouldn't have bought a steak before now or you know <clears throat> or chicken breast before, now you're all over it. So mm. and and that's just one of the challenges that that companies face in the food industry. So Mike, I, I want to ask you this, and that is um, in, in the food industry with this pandemic and seismic societal disruption, how are companies maintaining continuity and operations uh, during this time? Yeah, and I, I think, you know, Greg, you and Scott both touched on um, just supply chain disruption as a whole, right? And, and a, a, an enormous uh, amount of credit goes to the supply chain teams in uh, the, the the toilet paper industry, the paper towel industry, cleaning, disinfecting uh, products, medical supplies, uh, you know, import goods, uh, oil and gas industry, right, have all experienced just significant uh, 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 unprecedented disruption in this time. Yep. In the food supply chain, I think we've been hit kind of on both sides, right? The the supply side significant, significant disruption, but also a significant shift on the demand side, right? So um, if you think about the supply side, give or take half of the food that gets consumed in the United States uh, is consumed in the food service sector. Mm. Uh, and that would include restaurants, institutions, uh, institutional uh, food service, um, you know, cafeterias, uh, break rooms, things like yep. that. Right. And, and that that demand has effectively disappeared, uh, totally disappeared. The supply chain for that side of the supply is totally different than it is on the retail side. Uh, packaging is different. Uh, standards are different. Uh, regulations are different. The, the USDA and the FDA uh, manages those uh, those channels differently than they do retail. Uh, right. the, the, the grading uh, of food is, is done differently. Um Customer expectations are also different, right? When you when you see food prepared uh, at a at a restaurant or a cafeteria, you, you don't get to see how it comes, right? So um, things like the 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 ugly uh, fruits and vegetables, right? Well, that, that that thrives in that market because you see it prepared, not unprepared, right? So e enormous disruption there, uh, and and sort of fixing that side of the supply chain ha has been an extraordinary amount of work for, for everybody involved. Mm. At, at the same time, on the supply side, you're also seeing significant labor disruption. Uh, the, the, the supply side of the food supply chain is a very manual operation in a lot of cases, right? You, you have farmers in the field harvesting produce, um, and all of the supply side has been hit very hard by labor shortages. Um, at the same time, we've had labor shortages because of pandemic, because of uh, uh, infection in plants and things like that. We've also implemented, uh, you know, border crossing restrictions. We've implemented stay at home orders, which means that it's harder for companies to get labor into the plants to help manage this manual piece of the operation. Um, social distancing, also a, a huge impact on the food side. Um, when, when you're in a processing plant uh, and maintaining that social distancing uh, means infrastructure changes, uh, but it also in, in many cases means slower productivity, right? When you take, exactly. take half the people off of a, a production line, uh, all of a sudden your, your uh, throughput goes down pretty significantly. Uh, and, and suppliers and retailers have really been struggling uh, to, to source from different locations to help manage through that. Uh, working through the regulatory agencies to make sure that they are implementing uh, the uh, the retail standards or or relaxing the standards to make sure that they can get that food service uh, food into the supply. Mm. At the same time, boy, on the demand side, right? We we talked about uh, uh, re restaurant and food service and institutional demand has disappeared, 
at the same time, you had that kind of that early surge, the, the hoarding, uh, more of toilet paper and, and Clorox and things like that, um, but but also of food. Uh, and, and Aubrey touched on it, a lot of uh, comfort food, a lot of frozen pizzas, shelf stable, things like that. Um, but we've also seen, uh, you know, the price of eggs has gone absolutely through the roof. Uh, before yeah. the pandemic, uh, you, you could buy a dozen eggs in some stores for, you know, 59 cents. And I think they hit a high of four dollars and something uh, just because of that crazy surge in demand. Uh, and, and again, eggs is an interesting one because uh, retail eggs have a different grading system than uh, than food service eggs do and, right. and shell eggs versus liquid eggs and yeah. things like that. I was reading about that yesterday. I didn't realize, I, I think I got these numbers right, Mike, 20% of all eggs go to be liquefied. Yeah. Uh, and, and that, that side has really backed up and, and it's leading to some of these things that Aubrey spoke about some of the, you know, um, throwing things out in that, that no one likes, you know, and supply any, any supply chain professional, we hate <laughs> waste, right? In all we forms. Do. And, and it, I think it's been challenging for consumers to understand the points you're making, Mike, of why we're hamstrung to some extent, no pun intended to, 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 to uh, connecting these two very disparate supply chains between the food service and institutional side and your consumer, your retail side. That's so I appreciate where you come from and, and what you're sharing. Yep, you bet. And I tell you, one of the, I think the more fascinating things from a supply chain perspective is the shift from traditional retail to now uh, online uh, ordering and uh, store pickup and home delivery. Right, we, we have effectively transitioned retail grocery stores in the neighborhood to many fulfillment centers. Yep. Um, right, w which is not what they were built for. Um, you know, companies like Instacart, uh, Amazon, uh, Walmart, uh, Target. Have, have, Target uh, all up by, according to USA Today, I just read a, an article about that, but their, their sales are up over two thirds versus prior year, which is extraordinary. Yeah. Um, and 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 by the way, the Wasson household has driven a fair amount of that, um, <laughs> as well Thank as you uh, for helping the economy, Mike. But. That's right. Uh, companies like Schwann's that do kind of the frozen uh, frozen home delivery stuff. I saw um, that. I haven't seen a Schwann's truck in probably a decade, and I've seen a couple of them now. Yep. Well, we we signed up uh, uh, two two and a half months ago, give or take, uh, and have, have really enjoyed that. Uh, but 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 again, what's really interesting is as you shift that um, that that consumer demand from you know push your shopping cart up and down the aisles to online ordering, and and now your your local uh, retail grocery store is a fulfillment center. Uh, it, it's created a whole new shift in demand for our product, right? Where um, we we have a uh, a reusable grocery tote uh, that's built for that online grocery fulfillment. Um, you used to only have demand for that in the EU. Uh, we we brought that over to the states. Uh, I mean, almost immediately, seeing really nice um, nice adoption of that and and pretty pretty good growth in that e-commerce space. So. So that was my next question. I think you're kind of leading to my next question. I'm really interested in how you all, how Tosca and your company and your products are adapting in this in this ever changing environment. So tell us a little bit about that. Yeah. Well, so first, let me say, uh, and I want to make sure um, we, we come back to the fact that we we cannot adapt. We cannot take care of our customers if we don't take care of our team. Uh, I, I am extraordinarily proud of the Tosca team, uh, how we've stepped up to meet that uh, that increased demand and the shifting demand uh, for our customers. We, we have a culture at Tosca of always putting the customer first and, and having that mindset kind of going into this pandemic really allowed us to continue to operate seamlessly through the disruption. Um, we have an amazing supply chain optimization team, a logistics team, transportation team, uh, transportation partners with our carriers and our 3PL, uh, our sales and support team, uh, all in everyday contact with our customers, in everyday contact with our 18 service centers across the, the United States, uh, using good established SNOP process stuff uh, to make sure that we never, ever missed an order to our customer. Uh, that there has not been a single disruption through the entire supply chain in any of the food service sectors that we support uh, caused by a, a, a gap 
uh, with Tosca and with the reusable packaging. And again, wow. in, in meat, eggs, produce, poultry, seafood, cheese, always have had those food safe, clean containers to pack their products in. Um, That's really impressive. So uh, Mike, I got I to gotta wonder, with, with the changing dynamic in produce and um, and meat and various other staples, bread and things that you you support. Did you see a, an initial drop in demand or an initial blip in demand? Was there any anything that kind of stood out at you as you think about the transition through the pandemic? Yeah, we uh, the 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 fun part about it is we saw different shifts in different supply chains at different times. So to say we saw a a blip or a dip is is not true. It was just an explosion of mm -hmm. just all over the place, primarily because we saw shifting demand points, not not a drop in meat demand, for example, um, but a but a shift where uh, and, and you've seen it in in the national news every day where meat processing plants have been particularly challenged. Uh, so rather than sourcing from, uh, you know, Iowa, they would source from Pennsylvania or mm. Texas or Florida or you know, wherever, right. but, but a lot of movement of those demand points, creating a lot of challenges. Uh, and then, yeah, we, we, we saw it, it's, it's the very classic, uh, you know, bullwhip effect. Uh, my, my, my friend Dan Stanton would, would reference the, the bullwhip effect. Yeah, of course. Um, so a lot of initial surge is everybody panicked to go buy stuff and then realizing that online is available and things will get back to some new normal for, uh, for the, the retail space. Uh, and then we saw a dip because everybody had, you know, two years of frozen pizzas in their in their freezer, uh, and and then you there was nowhere else to put the fresh eggs. So we we'd see a right. bit of a dip, and then it and then it picks back up again. And uh, we're we're still seeing business strong. Uh, and again, because primarily our space is the retail perishable foods, not so much the food service side. Right. Uh, so we're seeing just continued steady growth, uh, steady demand uh, through that side. So uh, I want to want to transition here a little bit i want to move over to aubrey and bring her into the conversation talking food safety so uh, audrey uh, aubrey i'm gonna give you just a, a direct question that the consumers really want to know it's the aubrey right <laughs> giving um, me the easy ones yeah ask her <laughs> like right now right so is the food supply chain safe aubrey yeah the, the food supply chain is safe uh there's no evidence that suggests that food any other type of product packaging or materials can transmit the virus. Um, I think the FDA and Frank Yannis have said it best. He, he said and is quoted as saying, let me assure you first that the U.S. food supply chain is safe for both people and animals. Uh, there's no evidence of animal food or food packaging being associated with the transmission of the coronavirus that causes COVID-19. Um, so we've not seen any type of spread. It's all been community and people to people transmission. Right. And, and that's good to know. That's, that's also reassuring. Uh, you know, we were talking a little bit in the pre-show about some of the, the micro bursts we've seen at some of the processing plants, which, which has been challenging. Mike, you spoke a little bit to that. Uh, we also spoke a little bit about how that's a, a curveball that's being thrown in, the, in these unique times to the managers and supervisors at, at these sites that weren't built for physical distancing. So it, it's, um, it's important that, that we all know kind of what we're up against and how it's not, nothing is just easy. And, and even though some companies make it seem <laughs> real easy for same day delivery these days, supply chain, no, no, nothing too much easy about supply chain. All right. So, uh, tell me, Mike, tell us more about what you're seeing other companies doing, including what some of the things that Tosca is doing, to reduce the impact, and you were talking earlier about uh, the incredible job the Tosca team has done, and and how it's so important to take take you know take care of the team. What are you seeing companies do to make sure they mitigate the risk to employees? Yeah, I think, um, and and I'm I'm going to ask Aubrey to weigh in on this as well too, because I think there's maybe two different sides of it. Um, as a uh, we are considered an essential service, right? Food service uh, and and the packaging side of it. And we have been, uh, I think, really fortunate to have had such a great infrastructure uh, in place uh, before the pandemic, right, Wh which allowed us to continue to operate well. Uh, for Tosca, and I think you've seen similar reactions from a lot of different companies, but, but for Tosca, 
our, our U.S. and our global operations continue to operate effectively, keeping all of our team members and all of our products safe uh, because of that rigorous food safety management system that we had in place. Uh, and I, I think an extremely early adoption of uh, the, the CDC guidelines, really mm -hmm. staying in front of that. Um, we, we started uh, back, back in March, actually right after uh, Modex, uh, we, we decided to to try the work from home for all of our support staff, all of our administrative and, and corporate folks. Uh, we, we decided to try it and and kind of test the system on a Friday, uh, and we never went back. Right, we 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 made the early decision that we were going to do everything that we could, um, and 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 since then we have had. Uh, daily meetings of our leadership team and our task force. Uh, we, we're closely monitoring uh, the, the, the World Health Organization, the CDC, the FDA, uh, other industry trade groups, um, mm -hmm. you know, looking for those daily updates, which, uh, and sometimes it's multiple times per day. Right. Uh, we have had tremendous communication internally in our, uh, in our plant facilities, right, where, where you, you can't work from home uh, and provide clean, uh, sanitary, safe uh, food containers. Uh, that that just doesn't work. So we, we've had tremendous communication, uh, daily updates, daily department meetings, um, worldwide town hall meetings to make sure that everybody lots stays connected. Lots of communication. Um, like most other uh, organizations, I think that are seeing an increase in demand, uh, we've implemented. You know, uh, we, we call healthy habits. Uh, you know, incentive programs and things like that. Not, not to, um, I, I, some organizations have called it, you know, hazard pay and, and things like that. that. That is not all our intent. We don't believe that there is any additional risk or hazard for coming to work because we provide a clean, safe environment for our employees to come to work in. We, we, we created a healthy habits program to try and incent our teams not only to be safe when they're at work, but also to encourage those safe behaviors when they leave work. Mm. Um, and, and, and again, because we have a food safe environment, I think adopting a lot of those practices has been easier for us. Yeah. Uh, but, but, but similarly, we do, you know, every, uh, every shift, every break, every lunchtime, every, everything we're, we're wiping down time clocks and, right. and badge readers and uh, foaming and sanitizing all of our equipment and things like that. And, and maybe that's a, a good time to hand it off to Aubrey and let her talk yeah, a little Aubrey, bit more in detail. Are you working from home or are you working in the office or both? Or I am from home. Uh, so I am working from home. Uh, before this, I was traveling between our facilities probably about 85% yeah, of my time. Uh, so this has been a little shift for me. But um, most of my work can be done from home, making sure we support the facilities. So all of our service centers in the U.S. are certified to the ISO food safety standards. Uh, and Mike inferred that when he was saying how easy it was for us to switch over and deal with new information for the pandemic. Um, we're required to have an emergency response program. Typically, you see that program dealing with smaller scale emergencies, maybe like forest fires or you Hurricane. might have to shut the hurricanes, tornadoes. Um, and certainly we can take those principles and apply them to what's going on here. Um, so under that plan, we've activated a risk assessment, uh, not only to our business, uh, but to the product itself to make sure it maintains its safety. Uh, we've looked at developing a business continuity plan that tells us where our highest risk is and what we need to do to make sure we maintain operations. Uh, we put together the pandemic response team. They meet uh, every day and they get updates from all of our functional departments across the network. Uh, and then we've updated a lot of our programs to make sure we meet the FDA and CDA, CDC recommended guidelines. Um, so we've got a biosecurity program, GMPs, and sanitation programs in place. Uh, and we've done things like require social distancing. Uh, all the breaks, clock-ins, trainings are on the floor with six feet apart, no longer in the conference room. Uh, more frequent cleaning. So we are cleaning the lunchrooms and employee entrances uh, after every shift change and uh, open options for face coverings. So some local areas have required them. It's optional for all of our service centers to use those. And the biggest part and one of the key things is because we are food safe and we have a GMP program, we normally require team members who are ill to stay home. 
So they're not supposed to come to work anyways. And we've right. reinforced that with COVID-19. If they're showing symptoms, we are asking that all team members stay home, especially if they know they've had primary or secondary contact. Yeah. Well, you know, uh, going back to what you shared earlier, and I think, I think it's important to note, first off, that Tosca is a well-recognized leader, a variety of third parties uh, from their the growth to their approach to workforce, to be an employer of choice. So uh, uh, in many ways, Tosca is setting the bar, which is great to hear. And, and hopefully you're throwing the gauntlet down and some companies may be listening to this that are looking for ideas to, to ramp up their efforts, to take care of the workforce. So I appreciate y'all sharing. But going back to what you touched on, uh, you mentioned hurricanes and tornadoes, and we're in that season. Yeah. Um, you know, we, we partner with our great friends over at Resilience 360 on uh, their hurricane, their 2020 hurricane kind of things to expect, the tropical report. And unfortunately, um, hurricane season's not being postponed because of pandemic. I'm not sure if y'all follow <laughs> Bangladesh. Oh, a massive storm was making landfall, I believe, yesterday. Uh, and it, it's, it is going to make it so much more challenging despite all the challenges we face to enter into hurricane and tropical season and all these challenges get compounded by the normal stuff that happens each year. So um, we'll keep our finger on the pulse there, but um, all right. So as we wrap up this, this portion about food safety and before we move into kind of some lessons learned and what to expect as y'all break out your crystal balls, uh, Mike, starting with you, what else are we leaving out? What else is important to when we talk about food supply chain during these pandemic times, what have we not touched on, Mike? Uh, well, so I guess first, let me say, right. So I, I do feel like, um, uh, and I, and I appreciate your, your, your acknowledgement. T Tosca tries to be on the forefront, uh, but we're also a learning organization, right? So mm -hmm. we are reaching out to other industry partners, um, you know, trade groups, things like that. We are constantly trying to learn from others as well. Uh, it, it is, uh, it, we, we shared a lot of what I think are sort of funny uh, pictures when you look at them because it, 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 it looks very different than normal. Uh, some of the things that Aubrey was talking about, you know, on the, on day one, uh, we started putting, uh, you know, tape X's on, uh, on break room chairs and tables uh, and, and lines on the floor to show what that six foot distancing looks like before all the sign manufacturers got in the game. Uh, right. and, and we, you know, we had handwritten signs and, and again, just, just putting marks on the floor to maintain that social distancing. Uh, and, and then we started actually taking tables out of the break rooms and putting them outside. So we could still have uh, people have breaks and, and eat their lunch and things like that, but, but keep the social distance. So, so a lot going on there um, and, and uh, not, not in any way claiming to be the, the expert on this, uh, but, but we've got really good people you and really action. good. Yeah. You've, you've well, taken yeah, action. we, we, we have a pretty strong bias for action, uh, I think. Um, and, and hopefully we see that not, not, uh, just from me, but from every, uh, every level in the organization has that bias for action. Well, Mike, if I, I can tell, you know, just this week, the experts are, are sending different messages. It, I, it's, it's tough to find true experts in these truly unique times. So I love a bias for action because, you know, every step we take, is it going to be, is not going to work out perfectly? But if we don't take them, we don't learn and we can't respond and, and adjust. Um, so, you know, so a company that has a strong bias for action, their workforce is going to be better off. Uh, they're going to become uh, an expert before other, you know, lagging organizations. So I can appreciate what you're sharing there. Yeah, thank you. But uh, so, yeah, I think your question was what, what else is, uh, What's yeah. important to know. Um, so, so for us, we, we touched on this at the beginning, right? So, so Tosca is all about eliminating waste from the supply chain um, in, in the U.S. And, and really everywhere in the world, but but specifically in the U.S., where our our strongest market presence is, uh, there is a very large population of food insecure people mm. before the pandemic. Um, but before before this hit, like one in seven people in the U.S., uh, one in seven Americans are food insecure. They don't know where their next meal might come from. Uh, and, and that includes like 11 million uh, children, um, mm -hmm. elderly, uh, low income families really impacted by food insecurity. And, and that's getting uh, worse and worse now. Um, now, more than ever before, it's important to make sure that the supply chain works to deliver food from the farm to the fork. Uh, mitigating that food insecurity anywhere that we can. Um, 
and, and I think that is one of the areas we we touched on at the beginning that Tosca is so proud of being able to provide that packaging that that uh, it, it doesn't eliminate food waste, but it certainly does mitigate food waste uh, through the supply chain. We we can't help get it out of the field uh, necessarily. We we can't eliminate the labor challenges uh, in some of those areas, but we absolutely can uh, make it more efficient, more ergonomic. Uh, better cubulization on on uh, trucks, uh, more efficiency uh, from getting it off of a truck and onto the store uh, shelf uh, or or cooler uh, to get it to the consumer. Uh, for the e-commerce stuff, we talked about getting it uh, to to the car uh, at the store pickup space. Uh, really, uh, I think RPCs make sure that more food ends up uh, going to the homes that need it, and we're really proud of that. Um, uh, Aubrey, I'm, I'm certain yeah. you've got thoughts here as well. Yeah, I think also, so we do know there's a lot of food, food insecurity and um, we don't like to talk about it, uh, but we do know that the USDA is trying to help. Uh, thankfully, all that food we talked about that might be getting plowed under because it's supposed to go to food service. Um, a lot of the acts that have passed to help with COVID, uh, a lot of that money is earmarked with the USDA and FDA to go towards purchasing those goods. Um, and they're taking those goods and they're putting them into programs that are going to help uh, help those groups. So they're going, uh, they're looking at alternate options like delivering meals via the regularly scheduled bus routes. Um, they're letting parents come into schools and pick up weeks worth of their kids' meals so that they can have meals at home. Um, we've looked at entering, they've looked at entering private partnerships with companies to deliver meal boxes, kind of like Home Chef, uh, because they are on food assistance, uh, SNAP's moved online. So families don't have to go into offices to access their food benefits. They can go online, phones or computers. Um, and then all that excess inventory, they've earmarked millions of dollars to purchase excess produce, protein and dairy. Right, love yeah. that. That's, that's an incredible initiative by the industry. We've seen companies built to take advantage of food waste and to deliver valuable and still edible food to people in need. There's a company here in Atlanta called Gooder. Jasmine Crow is the CEO and, and that's what they do. They coordinate with groceries and restaurants and other institutions to take that food and make sure that it gets used. As she said, she quoted, hunger is, is not a supply problem. I'm paraphrasing, but <laughs> it's not a supply problem. It's a logistics problem. The food is available. 40% of all food is wasted, mm -hmm. right? So we know that the food is available to the 17% of the population, Mike, that you're talking about. So uh, we know we can get it there. And then we talked also with Terrence, whose last name escapes me from Love Beyond Walls, and they um, have initiatives to actually hit the street and, and uh, get people fed and fresh water and that sort of thing. So as we transition here, I want to get a few hot takes from you two. So down, you know, high level answers. Aubrey, I'm going to start with you because yeah. we love throwing these tough questions at you. And, <laughs> um, so what is, what is the greatest challenge the supply chain has faced during COVID-19 in your opinion? Uh, so I think that's the constant change of the news. Um, in food safety, we already expect that we're going to have to anticipate change and get ready to change with customer demands or industry regulation. Uh, but with this pandemic, the news is constantly changing, whether that's on the hour or to the day to the week. Uh, regulations from the CDC, WHO and the FDA have changed from where, what we saw in March to what they are today. Um, and so keeping on top of that, making sure we're using reputable sources to make our decisions uh, and making sure we try to get through all of the weeds and communicate one message to our teams and our customers about what we're doing. Mm -hmm. I think you have to really distill the information you're getting, even if it's from expertise and and authorities, and determine what it means to you. And you your definitely do. Yeah. So, Mike, what's yours? What do you think is the biggest challenge we face? <clears throat> yeah, well, I, I think Aubrey hit on the big one, right? And and if you don't like uh, the news, you change the channel, and you'll get a totally different perspective on it. Um, but you know, from a from a supply chain perspective, right? We we touched on. Um, the, just the constant volatility in the supply chain, right? Shifting, uh, shifting supply, shifting demand. I, I think those are very short-term challenges that the supply chain will face, right? I, I think some of that will 
we'll get back to whatever the new normal might look like. Mm. Uh, but but that that's a question of uh, you know working with uh, truckers and uh, and drivers and logistics companies to make sure that we're managing that. Uh, I think the greatest challenge is going to be the labor side of it, um, right? The the infrastructure to support the food industry is not built for social distancing. Uh, it, it, it's really not built for uh, all of that shifting demand either, right? If you think about the, the meat industry, uh, you, you kind of got to process that uh, in, in certain areas, right? You can't pick up uh, a herd of you know fifty thousand head of cattle and move it across country to where the labor is available. Right, it just doesn't work out really well. Uh, so I think the labor is going to be really tough. I think the travel restrictions, where uh, particularly as we're bringing in uh, workers from out of the U.S. Uh, and and mandating uh, quarantines or, or fourteen day you know self quarantine things like that, is going to make it particularly difficult, um, especially from uh, south of the the U.S. border. Uh, I, I think there's going to be uh, a lot of challenges, again, in that infrastructure to, to create a safe place where workers are ready, willing, and able to come back into the space. Uh, and, and that's kind of universal, right? Not just in the processing plants and, and in the harvest areas and the, um, you know, the, the packaging uh, space, uh, but, but even in the office space. And I, I will yeah. tell you, um, the, the, uh, uh, the technology to support uh, working from home, the technology to support uh, th these these kind of events uh, virtually has has been terrific and and what a godsend. Um, our our sales team, uh, our engineering team that really needs to be hands on uh, mm. is really struggling. I think with with travel restrictions and and things like that and and are dying to get back to work. Uh, but 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 I think that's going to be the biggest uh, challenge going forward is redefining that new normal and creating a a, a workspace where people are comfortable going back to work and and not just comfortable, but but a safe environment for them to return to. Yeah, I agree. All right, so Aubrey, I'm gonna hit you with a tough one again, yep. um, but this, this should come right from your experience or heart or wherever you store this information. What What is the biggest learning that you've had during this uh, pandemic? Yeah, so I think one of the biggest learnings is that um, I'm really glad we have a food safety program in place. Uh, <laughs> recently, uh, the standard we are certified to with ISO did get updated. Um, we saw a change in that standard to align with their other standards to go from not just looking at the food safety risk, but business risk as a whole. Uh, that really aligned well to what's going on right now. Um, we've also seen that we have programs in place that can be updated. Uh, we do have an emergency response plan and a biosecurity plan, um, but our biosecurity is more worried about the product. We're worried about avian influenza and tomato brown rugose fruit virus. We're not worried about uh, biosecurity coming from people. Uh, so we've seen some learnings that we can update those programs, make them a little bit more effective in the long term uh, if something like this were to ever happen again. Hmm. Interesting. What about you, Mike? What's the biggest learning? I mean, you sit in the executive suite. So you've already expressed your learnings about work, work in the future, what you think it will look like. And you must be considering a lot of different things as you try to position the organization to proceed. So tell tell me what you think you've, is the biggest, most important thing you've learned. Yeah. I, I mean, I think a, a couple of different things, right? Uh, one, one big learning uh, we, we talked about earlier, uh, you know, plowing under crops and depopulating herds and things like that. Um, we we have to create supply chain infrastructure that can react to those changes. Uh, McKinsey, um, I, I think I'm getting this right. McKinsey predicted like a 15% increase uh, in online grocery sales, right? That, that again, shifts the infrastructure, creating many fulfillment centers at, at your local retail space, which is different. Uh, and, and we need to make sure that the supply chain is, is prepared to support that. Uh, and, and in some cases it is, in some cases it is not at all. Uh, certainly the, the shift in um, retail demand versus the, the uh, food service and the restaurant space is going to create uh, a, a change that, and it will never look the same again, right? Um, many, many, many restaurants uh, have, have closed or are going to be permanently out of business uh, because it's a it's a pretty tough market to be in on a on a good day, um, right. and, and they will never recover, which will create 
you know, kind of a ripple effect, not just in the food space, but in the uh, real estate space and the and all the industries that support the food space. Uh, and it'll create a shift in labor availability because uh, that um, you know frontline food service worker, not, not just the servers, uh, the, the the cooks, the dishwashers, right? All of those jobs will be impacted, and that will create a pretty significant shift in available labor uh, for those unskilled workers. But at the same time, uh, th- those are the jobs that are going to be, I think, most at risk. Uh, as companies look to implement automation, um, right? Th- this has created a whole new awareness of how dependent some industries are on frontline labor. Uh, and I think through this, people are going to be looking at uh, how, how do we make sure that we're not as dependent on people? How, how do we put in uh, automated material handling? How do we put in robotics, uh, things like that, so that we're not as dependent? We pay particular attention to that because, uh, again, uh, reusable packaging and our RPCs are, are much more uh, standardized and much more easily automated, with, which is an expi- exciting space for us to be in. Um, you know, I, I think um, better business continuity planning, uh, yeah. Aubrey kind of touched on that, right? That, that yeah. constant updating, that constant learning as an organization. Uh, my, my old boss used to say, uh, and, and still a great friend of mine, uh, if uh, if the competition learns faster than you do, then you're at a competitive disadvantage. And I think in this case, that's true. But but take it a step further. If the consumer adapts faster than the than the companies do, that then you will be uh, uh, less valued, uh, maybe diminished in the industry. If if the consumer shifts demand and the consumer learns more about food safety and learns more about online shopping and, and things like that. Uh, and they do that at a faster pace than an organization does. Yeah. Yeah, you're you're going to find yourself out of business, I think, fairly quickly. All right. So I want to piggyback on that because uh, earlier this week in the Supply Chain Buzz, we featured a quote from Jeff Bezos. Uh, and whether you like what Amazon's doing in some ways, some ways or you don't like it, he's got a great quote. And you can see it in their culture, and and it's gotten a lot of feedback in our in our listenership. So, uh, Jeff said, uh, "quote Being wrong, and this fa- kind of falls in line with what you're saying in some ways, Mike. Quote Being wrong might hurt you a bit, but being slow will kill you. If you can increase the number of experiments you try from a hundred to a thousand, you dramatically increase the number of innovations you can produce. And you know, I think when we, as we shift gears, as we start to wrap up the interview, and we look for the silver linings and all of this." You know, um, perhaps, and, and not that we would ever want a pandemic to do it, but, but perhaps the industry needed a kick in the seat of the pants to, to stimulate some innovation, right? Uh, Mike, I love how you talked about how you're going to see these two disparate uh, supply chains that, that serve the food industry, how we're going to figure out how to bridge that so you can we can pivot much more effectively. I love that. I think it's going to require, like any big supply chain changes often do, while the consumer is the North Star and it's all about the voice of the customer, still with some of these, with some of the ways that we're going to have to meet the demands, whether we're talking about reshoring and nearshoring, consumers are going to have to accept some of the things that come with that, including higher prices with some things. So right. it's going to be a fascinating, um, we're all, we all can't wait to get into the new normal where things are going to be different and get past this, this current state where, where, you know, a lot of folks have been, have been suffering, but there's going to be a lot of really interesting lessons learned, case studies, innovations that come out of this. But so along all those lines, sorry, uh, didn't mean to get on the soapbox there, but but Aubrey, I want to start with you. When we think about yep. silver linings from the pandemic environment, give me give me, give me me your, your favorite silver lining maybe in all this. I think the technology aspect. Um, Mike's mentioned this a couple of times, but the ability to leverage technology like this or Microsoft Teams has really been key to success at Tosca. Uh, We've been able to communicate information quickly and accurately. We've been able to collaborate across different functions. Uh, And I think that's really been important in this role because it's minimized the disruption to our day-to-day business. Mm, Love that. And I think um, there is gonna, it's amazing to see, Greg, we talk about this quite a bit, uh, how folks your Zoom has made a fortune. Everyone's jumped <laughs> on there, but there's been a lot of different ways that folks are leveraging technology in this in, in this environment. And you want to comment real quick before I move over the mic? Even 
even the opportunity to recognize that you need technology. I mean, let's let's mm -hmm. look at what is the core problem. Uh, this is a quick hot take. The core <laughs> problem in grocery retail is that replenishment is largely manual and that they don't know some foundational things like how many cartons of eggs they have in a system, right? Mm -hmm. now, and that is a particular exposure in North America, particularly the United States, because in virtually every market in the rest of the world, they know those things. And hopefully this, the silver lining is that the grocery industry will shift from their ancient, literally almost <laughs> 200 year old system of having someone else manage your inventory for you to using technology to do that, which creates the kind of adaptability and the information upstream in the supply chain that allows you to respond much more quickly. Yeah, great. Yeah. Go ahead, I, I, def I definitely think they will. Um, so the FDA has earmarked uh, what they're calling smarter food safety as one of their key initiatives uh, from FISMA updates. Uh, so with the FDA adopting it, we and the rest of us in the food supply chain are gonna have to adopt that. Um, so they are earmarking that it's on their agenda. They know there needs to be some updates. And I think the COVID-19 situation will definitely make that go faster. Love that, uh, Aubrey. Love that. Um, okay. So, Mike, we're, as we're wrapping up on some good news here, we're talking about the silver lining from the pandemic environment, especially in supply chain. <clears throat> what's what's one of your favorite stories here? Uh, boy, well, yeah, you know, it, it, it's uh, I think while we're still in the middle of it, it's hard to talk about silver linings, right? But but certainly can talk about maybe some of the high points. I, I think uh, Aubrey touched on a few of them. Uh, the, the the technology, the the connectivity with our teams has been has been terrific. For for me, the the silver lining is that um, th th this pandemic will create a new uh, work life balance, right? For for most all uh, workers, right? Um, the, the opportunity for me. Uh, to to be at home, uh, working from home, having dinner with my family every night, uh, it, it's created a new normal for me. Uh, I, I think it'll create a new normal, uh, and and we will come out of this, I, I believe, stronger than we were going into it. Uh, we we continue to learn and grow, not just as a as a company uh, or an industry, but as a as a people, as a country. We we continue to learn from different uh, countries. I think um, that this pandemic. In, in some unique way will create a more um, more of a connected uh, world right not mm -hmm. not to get maybe maybe too philosophical here but uh, but but we're learning from other countries uh, we, we have uh, not, not just the local calls here but but we talk to our plants uh, and our teams uh, all over the world learning from what's going on and, and how uh, Italy and Germany and the UK and, and Israel, uh, and others are are all learning from this and how they're adapting and how they're implementing uh, social distancing and implementing return to work policies and things like that. So, so I think that might be a silver lining as well, is that maybe we won't be quite as uh, proprietary. Maybe, maybe we'll share a bit more than we have in the past. That interesting observation, and it definitely will we'll be keeping our finger on the pulse for that. I liked the, the first point you were making about the work-life balance. You know, we, we spoke yesterday or earlier this week with our, our buddy Ward Richmond, who spent uh, what seventy days on the road, <laughs> um, uh, and, and and how he's enjoyed home officing and seeing his family much more often and much more consistently, and how it's changed um, the dynamic there in a in a very good way. And and um, you know, there's good news out there. You got to seek it during, during these challenging times. But there's certainly plenty of good news, and and the industry will be, you know. Um, you hate to go through a pandemic for to have an industry improve itself like it will, but you know, the industry is going to be a lot stronger coming out of this eventually than it was, uh, you know, just 12 months, six months ago. Um, all right. So, uh, Greg, what a, uh, what a conversation, one that we haven't really had enough of on the food supply chain here on the show really have enjoyed Mike and Aubrey's take. Huh? I, I think that's the interesting thing about it is we haven't really talked about, food safety and the detailed logistics of retail. And I think it's important for consumers to recognize that as well. Yep. So yeah, that's been really valuable info. Yeah, thank that, you yes. Thank you both. And thank you for what you do. I think that point you just made there, I think 
consumer education in terms of how supply chains work and what's behind it. I think that's going to be another silver lining of all this. And it'll be, that'll be good for industry, right? We've seen a resurgence yeah. of interest. We know we're going to need a lot more top talent coming into the industry. And, and that's you know, yet one more silver lining here. Okay. So as we wrap up the segment, we want to make sure our listeners know how to get in touch with you both and learn more about Tosca. And Aubrey, let's start with you. Yep. So you can reach out to me on LinkedIn. Um, we also have more information at our Tosca website. Outstanding. That is ToscaLTD.com, right? Yes. Outstanding. And Mike? Yeah. So so also LinkedIn. And I do just really quickly, I want to touch on Greg's point, right? I, I think we will learn, uh, but but we cannot take care of the consumer. We cannot take care of business. We cannot take care of the food safety uh, and the food supply chain without taking care of our people first, right? And, and hopefully that'll be another big lesson learned uh, for organizations large and small is to take care of it and invest in your people uh, and they will take care of you and they will take care of your customers for you as well. Right. Uh, but anyway, LinkedIn uh, would be the place to find me, uh, toscaltd.com or mwasson at toscaltd.com. Outstanding. Well, really appreciate that perspective. Yeah. I love wrapping up on that note because it is all about protecting the workforce and beyond protecting them, appreciating what they do. You know, from the truck drivers to the pickers, packers, to the forklift drivers, to the folks in production and processing, you name it. It's, it's all about the global supply chain community. And, and that's right. And then <laughs> folks at the, at the registers, <laughs> I mean, yeah. to put man on the moon, right? That's right. That's right. Yeah, for um, free to everyone the same. Amen. Yeah. Um, okay. So with all that said, want to thank our guests here today, Mike Watson, Chief Operating Officer with Tosca and his colleague, Aubrey Duncan, Director of Food Safety with Tosca. We look forward to having you all back on, maybe as, especially as we get into you know, late 2020, uh, we'll have you back on to kind of give us your latest insights in. But thank you so much. Thank you for having thank us. Thank you. Appreciate it. All right. Take care. Wow, what a conversation. It, that, that is tough to get all of that information about an industry that is uh, – everyone's trying to get as much information as they can because we all experience stores and grocery stores and food, right. supply chain, uh, a lot of good stuff there. Well, when people think about retail, they think about supply chain so or, or they think about groceries. So you, you have to acknowledge that that is one of our top and favorite um, and most relevant – discussions around supply chain and, and retail is yeah. is grocery I, you know i think consumers have to recognize too that the some of what we talked about there is as you said scott it's dependent on their tolerance for um paying a higher price because the two industries that mike talked about frequently frequently food service and food uh, distribution, the distributors in those industries literally make no net margin. They have to forward buy inventory yep. in many cases to have any kind of margin to pay everyone. So, so it's going to, it's going to be painful if we want those solutions, we're going to have to be really creative. There's no silver bullet. It's not that we're going to cross every single item in food service right. with grocery distribution. We'll find the right places to do that and create those efficiencies. Yeah, so. great point. You know, I, I tried to weigh in earlier because I think a lot of our listeners may not know just the, the global grocery and retail experience you have. Uh, and and I, won't, I won't say, uh, what's our go-to? No more than two decades or yeah. what have you. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, you've worked with uh, retailers here in the States and Europe and, and really globally. So I, I, I've enjoyed kind of how you and Mike and Aubrey kind of tackled this uh, this conversation here today. Okay. So really briefly, as we wrap up here today, you know, fun stuff. Yes, that's right. And, you know, our supply chain trivia is our 1%. It's so much different than all the rest of our content. We're trying to meet the demand we see uh, where folks want to uh, de-stress a bit. They want to they want to enjoy some camaraderie and some fellowship with the with their fellow supply chain professionals, which, by the way, you don't have that's to be a supply chain after. professional. That's What's what that? you're after, Scott. I'm I'm just looking to watch anything that even remotely approximates sport, and <laughs> this has every bit of that. Smack right. talk, studying, you know, working out, people challenging one another, and a really amazingly competitive spirit among right. really knowledgeable supply chain pros. So it's a blast to watch. 
You are correct. So big high five to our reigning champion, Kobe Canoli. Got every question right in the last contest. Um, our next challenge is our Eastern Hemisphere edition, June 3rd, 9.30 uh, a.m. Eastern Daylight Time. We're partnering with Sapix, which is doing some awesome things in their neck of the woods, uh, especially Africa, uh, when it comes to supply chain, moving the industry forward. Uh, so 9.30 a.m. Wednesday, June 3rd. And But before we get there, uh, tell us about this, this webinar coming up May 27th, Greg. Well, you know, Gartner uh, has recently released their supply chain top 25 for 2020. We are going to meet with the, pro, the curator and master of ceremonies, Mike Griswold, who runs and presents uh, this amazing study that identifies who are the best supply chains in the world. On May 27th at, at noon Eastern time, stay up late if you're in India, um, it, we're going to talk about some of the takeaways from that and what other companies can learn, big, small, in, in the same or in different industries. We can cross-pollinate a lot of knowledge across the supply chain professionals to get this, uh, get this information into people's hands and help them improve themselves and their business. That's right. Well, well put. And uh, there's going to be plenty of takeaway and insights, regardless of the size of the business that you work or lead. So join us May 27th. You can go to supplychainradio.com to sign up for trivia. You don't have to sign up, but it's helpful if you do. We send out instructions ahead of time. You do need to sign up for the webinar. You can register there at supplychainradio.com. If for some reason you can't find what you're looking for, whether it's something we mentioned on today's show or something related to one of these two events, or if you want to find a way to collaborate with our Supply Chain Now team, uh, shoot a note over to Amanda at SupplyChainNowRadio.com, and we'll make sure that you get taken care of. All right. So, uh, Greg, as we wrap here today, great show, food supply chain, food safety. Why don't you take us out? All right. Well, first of all, thanks to everyone for joining us. Thanks to Mike and Aubrey for sharing a tremendous amount of knowledge. And remember... As Scott loves to say, brighter days lie ahead. Join us wherever you get your podcasts. Get some, get some uplifting knowledge along with supply chain knowledge. And wherever you are, we hope you're safe and sane and sanguine. I'm going to let you look that one up. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>